Our extreme countdown begins with the She-Devil. This Tasmanian devil is pregnant, and she's collecting bedding for her underground lair. For in Australia, devils do live underground, but they prefer a soft bed of leaf litter to the fiery pits of hell. But no matter how soft the bedding, giving birth appears extremely uncomfortable. And yet for all this effort, the Tasmanian devil gives birth to joeys that are no bigger than a grain of rice. Imagine if we gave birth like a she-devil. Life would be so much easier. Because if we were like the Tasmanian devil, we'd have a newborn baby the size of a ping pong ball. How'd you like to deliver a baby that weighed seven grams? For the Tasmanian devil, giving birth may be easy. But now the blind, hairless, helpless joeys must make a dash across their mother's belly to the safety of her pouch. The trouble is, that there may be 30 joeys and only four nipples. Aren't you glad you're not a Tasmanian devil baby? Imagine what it would be like to be a helpless baby thrown into a race for survival against all your brothers and sisters. That's because only the first four babies to get to the milk will survive. The Tasmanian devil is number 10 in the countdown because it's not easy for a helpless infant to find its way to the booby prize of life. For the winners, life is good. For the losers, life is short. Because the she-devil will eat the babies that didn't make it to the safety of the pouch. While our babies may not face a sprint for survival, every one of us started life with a race of a different kind. Every human male puts 500 million sperm on the starting line. In theory, that's enough sperm to impregnate every woman in North, Central, and South America. But just like the Tasmanian devil, only the fastest will survive, because the finish line consists of only one egg. Only one sperm will make it. All the rest will die. It's a tough race, but it's one that every human takes part in just to be born. Back at the Devil Den, things are getting tough for the She-Devil too. For although giving birth to grains of rice may have been easy, as the joeys grow bigger, these little devils make their mother's life a living hell. She has to put up with these little imps for 28 weeks, which would be enough to try the patience of a saint, let alone a devil. Perhaps understandably, the male Tasmanian devil has nothing to do with the raising of his offspring. Unlike our next contender, who takes the role of sensitive new age guy to the ultimate extreme. When it comes to births, usually men are pretty useless. Congratulations, gentlemen. The stork has just delivered your baby. Yours, Mr. Williams, weighs six and three quarter pounds. And yours, Mr. Smith, nine pounds. Now, if you'll step out through the nursery window, you can see the baby. But there's one animal that changed the role of fatherhood forever. The seahorse is number nine in the countdown because this most unusual fish 
as a most unusual way of giving birth. It all starts off as normal. Boy fish meets girl fish and they form a pair bond. It's all very romantic because they're completely monogamous and share everything together. But then, the female seahorse goes on the world's most extreme form of maternity leave, as Kirsty Forsgren from the Long Beach Aquarium explains. Seahorses are probably one of the most extreme examples of parental care in the animal kingdom. It is the male that actually becomes pregnant. He actually um, holds the eggs within a pouch, nurtures them when they're ready to be born. He actually goes through labor and contractions while having the babies. It's a strategy designed to lighten the female's workload. Once she's carefully deposited the eggs in the male's pouch for him to look after, the female's able to concentrate on making more eggs. After the female gives the eggs to the male and he's incubating them, these animals form monogamous pairs and the females probably stay around to give moral support to the male. She's got him pregnant. She wants to stick around, make sure that her offspring are born. The seahorse is number nine in the countdown because after a month of being pregnant, it's the male that gives birth. His big belly can carry up to 500 tiny seahorses. It doesn't matter if you're a seahorse or a human. Being pregnant isn't easy. Carrying a baby places all kinds of stresses on your body. Unlike seahorses, human fathers have never been able to really experience the physical demands of pregnancy. That was until the invention of the empathy belly. Wear this suit and you can discover what it's like to waddle around carrying an extra 10 kilograms. You'll also discover it increases both your blood pressure and the pressure on your bladder. Wear an empathy belly for a week, and you'd quickly develop a new respect for both pregnant mothers and male seahorses. But for most males, pregnancy is best left to the experts, especially when you see how hard carrying a baby can be for our next contender. After all, this is the most extreme countdown ever conceived. We're still to deliver the biggest babies on Earth. Breeders that know no bounds and a baby that's born pregnant. That's next on the most extreme. The kiwi is the strangest bird in the forests of New Zealand. It only comes out at night. It can't fly and it's the only bird in the world to have nostrils at the end of its beak, which is extremely useful when it's digging for worms. But the kiwi is number eight in our countdown because everything about its reproduction is extremely difficult. Even the moment of conception is a tricky balancing act when you have no wings. The kiwi is not the world's greatest lover. It seems to put in an awful lot of effort for very little reward. But these bad lovers are great layers. The kiwi produces one of the largest eggs in the world. It takes up an awful lot of room inside a little bird. Somehow, the female kiwi has to squeeze out this enormous egg. And if it looks painfully impossible, it's because the female kiwi is the size of a domestic hen, but its egg is 10 times bigger. How'd you like to be a pregnant kiwi? Imagine giving birth to a baby that weighed 20% of your body weight. If we gave birth like a kiwi, we'd have a newborn baby that weighed in at more than 13 kilograms. So spare a thought for the mother of a 10 kilogram baby, delivered by Tennessee doctor Lowell McCauley. The biggest one I've ever delivered prior to this was 12 pounds, 5 ounces. And this child here is one-fourth of the weight of my nine-and-a-half-year-old daughter. This is a big child. He may be big, 
but he's still not as extreme as the kiwi. That's because the kiwi's hard labor doesn't finish when the egg is laid. Now it has to be kept warm for nearly three months. And since the female is completely exhausted, it's up to dad to incubate the egg. And he does it all by himself because mom is off for a well-earned rest. Keeping the egg warm is almost as much work as laying it. The male seldom leaves the nest to feed. He'll spend up to 80 days on the egg and lose 20% of his body weight by the time the egg's ready to hatch. So why does the kiwi put so much effort into one huge egg? Most birds lay lots of small eggs that produce chicks that are helpless for weeks after hatching. But the kiwi chick is able to look after itself in only a couple of days. The parents' long struggle with the egg means they don't have to spend any time looking after an unruly teenager. By comparison, humans are very slow developers. It can take years for our babies to leave the nest. But thanks to the massive eggs, the kiwi's big babies are able to look after themselves. Size may be important to the kiwi, but next, we'll meet an animal that favors birth on an even bigger scale. We've witnessed three amazing births so far on the countdown, but there are still another six to arrive before we can name the most extreme breeder on the planet. Coming up, we'll be the judge as we count down to find out who really is the most extreme. Rabbits are number seven on our countdown because they're natural born breeders. Rabbits have a talent for making more rabbits. All you need is a grassy field and a pair of bunnies. If conditions are favorable, rabbits can start a new family every month. And they can do it over and over again for at least a decade. Imagine what would happen if we started to breed like rabbits. The average couple can only give birth to one baby a year. If we could breed at the rate of a rabbit, we'd have six babies every month. And it would only take six months before those babies can get pregnant too. If we bred like rabbits, in only a year, we could end up with an extended family of 414 babies. So why can't we give birth like a rabbit? While rabbits lay multiple eggs every month, we can only produce one. And it takes 10 times longer to develop. After 38 weeks in the womb, the baby is becoming a tight squeeze. After all, they're 600 billion times bigger than they were as a fertilized egg. Not only do we spend a longer time being pregnant than a rabbit, we invest even greater time in raising our slow developing offspring. The rabbit only needs to visit her baby bunnies for 10 minutes a day. That's enough for a quick drink and then they're on their own. But some humans turn raising bunnies into a full-time job. These people encourage rabbits to breed so they can show them off. Rabbit breeders have taken control of rabbit births. After all, they don't want their show rabbits getting pregnant to just any old rabbit. That's why they make sure that it's always one rabbit to a cage. And it's this selective birth control that led to the development of all these different breeds. 
But it's not just modern breeders that have recognized rabbits as the champions of breeding. In ancient Europe, rabbits became linked with the pagan goddess of fertility. Her name was Iastra. Every spring, she hired bunnies to deliver eggs around the countryside as a sign of new life and rebirth from the harsh winter. While belief in pagan rituals may have faded, the festival still remains. It's just that we change the name from Iastra to Easter. And now the bunnies are made of chocolate. But some people are sick of the sight of them. In 1859, an Australian farmer released two dozen English rabbits onto his farm. Within six years, 24 rabbits had multiplied to 22 million. Plagues of rabbits continue to devastate the land today, according to the Australian Museum's Mike Archer. I think one of the severest problems Australia has ever had to grapple with is what you could describe as the sort of wave of furry maggots that sort of swept across the continent. Rabbits. It was probably one of the most profound negative influences to have ever hit this continent. No wonder some Australians want to find a replacement for the Easter Bunny. Meet the Easter Bilby, a harmless native Australian marsupial. This is the animal Australians should celebrate in chocolate in any other way they can. So, everybody who has a concern for what's happened to the Australian bush is desperately anxious to sneak into the candy shops in the dark of night and sweep those chocolate bunnies off the shelf and replace them with delicious, wonderful chocolate Easter bilbies. Rabbits may not measure up to our next heavyweight contender, but that won't stop these bunnies from doing what they do best. Making a splash at number six in the countdown is the whale. That's because when it comes to breeding, whales do everything on a big scale. Even before the birth, some whales will swim more than 6,000 kilometers to reach their favorite breeding ground. These southern right whales have chosen New Zealand's sub-Antarctic islands. The warm water bays make an ideal nursery to raise young whale calves. It's also the perfect location to find out what the big deal is about whale birth. For a start, a female southern right whale is pregnant for an extremely short time. The fertilized egg of a southern right whale only needs 12 months to develop into a 900 kilogram calf. Yet it takes one of our eggs nine months to grow into a puny three kilogram baby. It's hard to imagine a single egg growing into a baby the size of a small car. At least humans can watch their babies grow, thanks to the invention of the sonogram. Sonograms are sound pictures, painted by a medical probe sending out ultrasonic sound waves. The beam of high frequency sound is able to pass right through the mother's skin and bounce back off the baby inside the womb. By reading the echoes of the probe, we can build up a picture of the unborn child. Imagine if we could give a right whale a sonogram. We'd be able to see that the enormous baby gets all its nutrients from its mother. Growing such a big baby in so little time puts such a tremendous strain on the female whale that it's no wonder she only gets pregnant once every three years. And unfortunately for this mother, life doesn't get any easier once her baby is born. Her wrinkled newborn calf is almost helpless. Its first lesson in life has to be how to breathe. Without enough blubber to be buoyant, its mother needs to give it a piggyback to the surface for air.
Once the calf starts breathing for itself, the mother's work really begins. That's because baby whales drink nothing but mother's milk. An awful lot of mother's milk. In fact, a right whale calf will drink more milk in a single day than a human baby drinks in a year. And because whale milk has 10 times more fat in it than the milk we drink from the carton, whale babies grow fast. In only one year, the right whale baby will have doubled in size. But believe it or not, it's still not the biggest baby in the sea. The blue whale is twice the size of a right whale, and its calf is the biggest baby on the planet. It's a hefty three tons at birth, but it grows fast. It gets nine times bigger in only one year. Imagine if our babies grew like a blue whale. On their first birthday, they weigh 27 kilograms. That's the size of an average 10-year-old. Whale calves may be extremely large, but there are still five other contenders that are more extreme. The whale is only number six in the countdown, because coming up, we'll push on to the most bizarre births in nature. You'll discover why this pregnant toad really will make your skin crawl. And what if these quadruplets got in common with this armadillo? Find out next on The Most Extreme. Some of the most bizarre births in nature are normally kept hidden away. But today, Becky Choquette is lifting the lid on the birthing rituals of the Suriname toad. Come February, things will be hopping here in the Suriname toad tank at the Honolulu Zoo. Dwayne and Darla will be feeling romantic and going through their mating ritual, and hopefully, in the months to come, we'll have lots of little baby Suriname toadlets. Suriname toads have a wonderful romantic mating ritual. Um, they spawn, like most uh, frogs and fish, and what happens is when the female is full of eggs and receptive, the male will court her and he'll grab her around the waist in a mating embrace. And while they're in this embrace, they'll swim in circles upside down in the water. So the couple is going to go like this. When they hit the top of the circle, she's going to release her eggs and he will release his sperm, so they'll be fertile. Then as they come down at the bottom of the circle, she'll catch all the little eggs on her back and the male will kind of help tamp them in with his hand. And then hormonal changes in her body will take over and cause the skin of her back to swell up, mostly covering the eggs, leaving just a little spot on the top. The Suriname toad is number five in the countdown because for them, birth really is backbreaking work. These South American toads work hard to ensure their toadlets have a head start in life. If we gave birth like the Suriname toad, we'd have to think very carefully about the arrival of 100 babies. But every day, over 350,000 new humans are born. And believe it or not, you share your birth date with over 16 and a half million other people on the planet. Luckily, they didn't all pop out of their mother's back. It's uncomfortable enough having a baby in your belly. So imagine having a hundred on your back. You definitely like to be able to accurately plan and postpone your own pregnancy. Just like our next contender.
at number four in the countdown, is one of the most common creatures in Texas, the nine-banded armadillo. It may not be able to roll into a ball like its three-banded cousin, but it can perform some rather remarkable reproductive tricks. To uncover the armadillo's extreme secrets, we have to go underground. This armadillo is getting ready to give birth. That's because, unlike us, armadillos can plan when they want to be pregnant. How'd you like to be able to delay the implantation of a fertilized embryo? If you think you're too busy for a baby, just delay it for up to three years. The nine-banded armadillo can postpone pregnancy to avoid a drought or a food shortage, and so give her offspring a better start to life. It's a nice trick, but there's something even more extreme about this pregnancy. The nine-banded armadillo always gives birth to identical quadruplets. That's because the armadillo's single fertilized embryo splits into four before it starts to grow. So armadillos always have a family of four males or four females, and they're always genetically identical. Texans are crazy about their dillos. This armadillo, called Diglett, has discovered some fellow quadruplets in the classroom. While they're not identical quadruplets like Diglett, they still defy the odds. You're more likely to be struck by lightning than give birth to quadruplets. And while quadruplets are still fairly rare, multiple births in America are becoming as common as Texan dillos. Clubs for twins, triplets, and quadruplets are getting overcrowded. And a group of researchers may have found the reason why. Artificial fertilization. In the U.S. alone, multiple births are up 1,000% since the introduction of modern fertilization techniques. To increase the chances of pregnancy, doctors implant more than one fertilized embryo in the womb at a time. And this increases the chances of a multiple birth. But the record for the most children born to one woman predates modern fertility methods by more than 200 years. Spare a thought for Mr. and Mrs. Vasilyev of Russia, who started a family back in 1725. Over the next 40 years, she gave birth to 16 pairs of twins, seven sets of triplets, and four sets of quadruplets. That's a world record 69 children. Perhaps Mrs. Vasilyev wished she could postpone her pregnancies like the nine-banded armadillo. So far in our extreme countdown, we've seen multiple births, back-breaking labor, and one gigantic baby. But still to come are feisty females that don't need males to get pregnant. That's next on The Most. Extreme. Spring has sprung, flowers are blooming, and number three in the countdown is getting ready for a big summer of breeding. Aphids have a fast and furious lifestyle. After hatching from their winter state as eggs, they're ready to reproduce rapidly. Aphids can bear live offspring when they're only five days old. That's why they're one of nature's fastest breeders. One female cabbage aphid can have up to 41 offspring in her lifetime. If all her offspring survived, by the end of the summer, there would be a population of nearly a billion, billion, billion aphids. That would leave America four meters deep in aphids. 
aphids have to breed fast because they only live for about three weeks. So aphids are born pregnant. How would you like to be a grandmother as soon as you had your baby? This extreme breeding is only possible because aphids can get pregnant without a boyfriend, as entomologist Rude Kleinpast explains. It's not much fun being an aphid, you know. They can have all the hassles of being pregnant without the fun of having sex. That's because all these girls, because that's what they are, they're all parthenogenetic, and that means that they can reproduce all by themselves without the bothersome interference of males. It's, if you like, nature's extreme solution to rapid breeding. But according to Greek legend, there was once a civilization a lot like the aphids. Amazons, shock troops of a civilization of superwomen. They are trained in the deadly arts of mortal combat. Their goal is to conquer, subdue, and enslave the world of men. The male of the species is the most inferior creature on earth. That our very existence depends on them is an unfortunate reality. They will have no fury like 10,000 women. Battle of the Amazon. Now, parthenogenesis, of course, is a real worrying trend, especially if you're a male entomologist. But it gets worse. You see, towards autumn, when winter is approaching, those females will lay the odd boy baby. They grow up, and those males will mate with females who will then lay eggs. And, of course, eggs are the best overwintering stage. But think about it. That means that these aphids only make males when they really need them. Now, that's what I call a real worry. But aphids aren't the only feminists in nature. Next, we'll meet a queen who has absolute control over her subjects. Our number two in the countdown lives inside a clay castle on the African plains. Up to five million termites live in this stately home. But it's the termite queen who's really extreme. Extremely large, that is. Her body is so swollen with egg-producing tissue that she can hardly move. But then, she doesn't have to, because she's so pampered by her trusted subjects. All the workers in the colony are her own daughters. The queen gives them instructions by emitting pheromones, odorless chemicals that she uses to keep the colony running smoothly. And thanks to pheromones, the queen suppresses her daughter's fertility, meaning that she's the only female able to lay eggs. Lots of eggs. And that's why the termite queen is number two in the countdown. Imagine if we could give birth at the same rate as a termite queen. If we were termites, our moms would be over 18 meters tall. She'd be giving birth so quickly that in only two days, we'd have enough babies to fill Yankee Stadium. termite mom could give birth every 15 seconds and have up to 30,000 babies a day. Imagine a city of 5 million people who all had the same mother. There would be no sex because everyone you met on the street would be your brother or sister. You'd think only insects could ever live in a city like that. But there is one mammal that lives like a termite. Meet the naked mole rat. Like termites, mole rats spend their life underground, excavating tunnels that stretch across an area the size of a football field. There's only one breeding female in this subterranean city, the queen mole rat. 
She produces a dozen babies every three months for a decade. She mates with her eldest sons, and just like a termite, she prevents all other females from breeding. She has all the mole rats under her control by depositing pheromones at the communal toilet. The pheromones are sure to rub off on everyone who pays a visit. But while the queen mole rat and the queen termite may reign supreme, there's still no match for the ultimate breeder on the planet. We've seen the nine contenders. They're the best of the best. Only one animal is a more extreme birthing machine. It's number one, and it's coming up next on the most extreme. Somewhere in this room is the most extreme breeder on the planet. But the countdown's number one isn't human. It's a parasite. Dining out in the gut of most mammals is the tapeworm. This parasite produces more offspring than any other creature on Earth. If you could give birth like a tapeworm, your children would fill the city of New York in two weeks. You'd be giving birth to a million babies a day. And if you're infected with a tapeworm, you probably do. Tapeworms are extreme breeders because they have more sexual organs than any other animal. Their body is a long chain of more than 2,000 identical segments, and each segment is almost entirely devoted to producing eggs. That's because the tapeworm's life cycle means that an egg has to be swallowed by another animal. And if we eat meat that's infected by a tapeworm, we get it too. But the chances of that happening are very, very small. That's why tapeworms release so many eggs in the hope that one might be lucky enough to find a new home. Some of them might end up here, at the National Parasite Collection in Beltsville, Maryland. And if you ask nicely, Dr. Eric Hoberg will show you his favorite tapeworm. To fill a bathroom, uh, here is a human parasite, and this is the largest of the human parasites. This is an intestinal parasite, uh, 75 feet long, and, um, but you may not even know that you're infected with it. Roughly about 50 million people in the world are infected with these parasites. It's a scary thought that lurking in your lower intestine could be one of 350 different species of human tapeworm. Although you may not like being the host of a parasite, you can't help but admire the tapeworm's incredible fertility. For when it comes to birth, the tapeworm really is the most extreme.